Okay, so hi everybody and welcome um, to the first part of a two-part panel for the participants in Not Yet Future Free. The second part will be next Saturday, May 23rd at, from 4 to 5.30. Um, Not Yet Future Free is our second exhibition and the curator is Natalie Bombay. Um, Natalie is a curator an arts worker based in Washington, D.C. She received her MFA from Maryland Institute College of Arts Curatorial Practices Program. Currently, she is Washington Project for the Arts resident storyteller and program manager for the Wherewithal Grant Program. Um, her research is based on storytelling, language, and science fiction and fantasy. And it's also important to mention that there is a website for Not Yet Future Free that acts as a kind of a living market. Um, thank you, Natalie. Yeah, I'll put the website in the um, comment section once we're done with intros, but thank you all so much. Kaylee, do you think we could mute everyone but the presenters? Is that possible? Or, or maybe just like if you're not presenting today, as a courtesy, mute yourself so we can keep the conversation moving. and. Um, please, in the comments section, put in any questions that you want us to address. We'll um, get to a Q&A at the later part of today. Um, but I want to make sure that we have enough time to feature all of these three amazing artists that we have with us today and get to hear from them. Um, I'm just going to start and briefly introduce our three panelists for today, <laughs> meeting in this virtual world. Um, Nina Q. Allen is a multidisciplinary artist who is also graduating with me from MICA this weekend. So congratulations, Nina. Um, Nina uses the language of the ocean to symbol symbolize matrilineal healing, divination, and Afrofuturism. Her work uses moon water, science, and color to symbolize growth, rebirth, and ancestral magic in two-channeled physical existence versus spiritual presence realms. And then next we have the incredible Rex Del Fakarin, who is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice is rooted in methods and acts of translation between multiple conflicting systems, static and motion, soft and hard, elements of Iranian American identity, body and ceramic, Iranian and queer, concrete and ceramic, English and Farsi, dance and sculpture. Thank you so much for being here, Rex. Um, and then finally, we have Ashley Shea, Ashley Shea is a body linguist. She is a first generation Cameroonian American artist born in Washington, DC, who carries on her cultural traditions of dance and storytelling as a means for remembrance and self-knowledge. Drawing on past, a past of performing and choreography based companies and competitive dance teams, her work has transitioned in the past five years to a more contemplative practice focused on an experimental and meditative approach to the study of movement. Through improvisational dance and experimental performance, she engages the potential for al alchemy, al <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, transformation in each moment through use of meditative moment, movement. And first of all, I just want to start and welcome everyone again here. It is so incredibly special to be able to meet you all in this virtual space. Um, we had intended to have these conversations in person, but so far throughout the course of this six-week exhibition. It's been particularly magical to be able to meet in this virtual space and connect with people near and far. And it's just, I'm so grateful for you all for joining us. And thank you so much for supporting our work. Um, to invite you all in and um, as a gesture of welcoming, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Shay for a brief moment. We're going to just send, ha she's going to lead us through a few movements and we're just going to, this is totally optional. You can watch and treat this as a performance if you'd like, um, but it's just a brief five, five minute um, option to center ourselves in this virtual space when we all feel, because it's pretty disconcerting to be having a conversation and seeing ourselves on a video and being so, hyper removed from our physical bodies at this moment. So thank you so much, Shay. I'm turning it over to you. Hi. Um, first, just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to all the artists. Thank you to Natalie. Thank you to Stable. Um, 
I'm really happy to be here today with you guys on this virtual platform. Um, as Natalie said, everything that I'm going to share right now is just an offering, so it's totally up to you whether or not you'd like to participate or observe. Um, so I'm going to begin by inviting everyone to turn their attention to their breath. Um, I'm not actually asking you to do anything with your breath, not to extend or basically just look, listen to your breath. Um, you can keep your eyes open or closed. As you're listening to your breath, you can begin to draw your attention to other parts of your body or any other sensations. So begin to notice any sounds you might be hearing, any sensations in your body, any thoughts you might be having, any emotions that might arise. And we're just noticing, we're not making adjustments or corrections. As you continue to listen to yourself, we're going to bring in some small motions, beginning with the head, you can look from left to right. Slowly continuing to notice the breath and the sending sensations. Mm -hmm. And we can nod the head up and down. And side to side, sorry, side, side. And then I rotate the head one way. And the other way. And we're just going to shift the torso from side to side. And finally, we'll just lift the shoulders as high as possible and drop them a few times. You can let out a side wing drop them if it feels good to you. And then we'll just draw our attention to our breath again. Again, noticing any sensations, any thoughts or emotions. Notice any changes. And let's all finish with one big sigh. So just inhale and sigh. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Hope you all feel grounded and present. Thank you so much, Shay. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that is because a lot of um, Shay, both Shay and Rex and Nina's work that we're going to be talking about today has so much to do with the body and movement and 
take that moment to, as audience members and participants, to really feel and um, graciously give ourselves that moment to check in with ourselves. So thank you. And Nina, I'm so excited to talk to you right now and hear about your work. Um, I, like I said before, um, this project has taken many different forms over the course of the last year in discussions with all of you. And um, I am so thankful for you all being so adaptive and um, for all of us to, at, in a rapid amount of time, rethink how we were going to present our work. Um, but yeah, Nina, I was wondering if you could just take it away and maybe start with what you've been working on over the past two years and thinking about and, um, and how that has shifted too. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's here. Um, I have a huge appreciation and um, a lot of humbleness um, for Natalie and all that she has done um, to guide me and, and help uh, blossom me um, to where I am now. I'm so appreciative for her. Um, she didn't have to find me and we connected just on the ocean and, you know, from a class in the fall of our first year in grad school. So um, many trained conversations about um, the body and about healing and uh, culture and history. I think that was the starting point to where I am now. Uh, so um, I just want to say thank you. She's amazing. And I, I look forward to continuing this type of dialogue outside of this space. And um, I see many great things for this project. And thank you all for um, supporting all of us in this. So, uh, yeah, so I, I have some things to share, but I'll just start off with saying, um, yes, I'm Nina Q. Allen. I'm from PG County, Maryland. Um, this is um, my last year as a grad student at MICA in the Mount Royal Multidisciplinary Program. So um, to class of 2020, we're gra our graduation was supposed to be uh, this, this week, basically, and um, it's shifted. But um, this platform, I think, uh, this virtual experience is still ways to stay connected. Um, so uh, a lot of my work, I, I, I would like to share that, um, and please visit the um, not yet future free .org site, as well as the MICA Grad Show 2020 site where you could view um, my work more extensively and, and see how I've combined um, photography, writing, and sound into something really magical. I, I use magic a lot. I'm a Pisces. So um, I, I think that uh, that is important when um, looking into my work further. Um, so I'm going to share screen now. This is my first time trying this, so bear with me. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. Okay. Mm. Good. I have a little buffering sample that <laughs> little rainbow. We yeah. can we can buffer with you. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I have to grant access to okay. One second, <laughs> everyone. Uh, Okay. Okay, this should work. If not, Nina, I can do it too from mine. Okay, I think I have it now. You have it. Okay, it's just taking forever. Okay, that's not what I want to share. Okay, this is <laughs> what I want to share. Uh, where are we? We're full glitching. Okay, there's tons of glitches. Just give me one minute. Okay. Hmm. And you know, while you're doing this, I guess we can talk too about how. Um, your work is very sculptural, 
So it's like, as we share your work in this medium, like that's something for everyone to keep in mind is that Nina was working on a huge immersive installation. <laughs> yeah, so originally I would share that um, my, I was working on a, uh, a sculptural sound um, physical installation in three different locations one on Micah's campus, one with Stable Arts um, with Natalie, and then one at the IMET at the Inner Harbor. And um, the, the series of, of shells and drop cloths and poetry um, were, um, I call them my mer, mer babies. And um, right now it's transformed into this memorial um, experience of um, calling it um, now what was once a title pre-pandemic. I have um, Banshee Basin Barnacle as my um, new title uh, for um, in honor of the triple moon goddess and um, having mother moon and mother ocean be a symbol or metaphor for my grandmothers who I feel like those are that is my backdrop that is my ceiling and my grounding place and breaking away from the the white walls of like western traditions that was my vision of really um, embracing that moment and, and being more in tune with myself so um, can everybody see the the screen? Oh, you can. Okay. All I see is just my things and little thumbnails. All right. So um, this first image, can everyone see the first like aura photo? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This, um, this image is a really powerful, um, it's three um, of one of um, the, the time that I had my aura photographed in, in New York at a place called Magic Jewelry on Canal Street. And um, these colors, um, how it picks up on body temperatures. I, I thought it was really eye-opening when I found out and discovered that uh, these colors were exactly what I was working on in grad school in my studio. And the, the shades of magentas, indigos, and violets were very present in the reading without me giving any type of information to the, um, the woman who actually wrote the information in a purple pen. So I said that was, you know, part of the universal connection. Um, and from this image, I started to really dig deeper into um, more color theory, more um, these deeper saturated tones of thinking of the abyssal plane. A lot of my work before, what were the lighter shades of all of this? Um, so I said, well, how am I gonna be more honest with myself and more true and working on vulnerability? and thinking of um, the women in my family who are the muses, uh, my grandmothers and my mom and working in sets of three together, they're myself. So I said, how can I be more honest if I'm, all of my work is still in the lighter surface level, if we're thinking of the ocean, I, I want to go down further. And um, that's can I stop you yes. for a second. Can you hear me? I don't know if I can hear you. Oh yeah, you're back. Now I can, okay. Did you wanna ask me something? Oh yeah, I think my internet cut out for a little bit. Um, oh. <laughs> sorry, glitches all over. Um, I was gonna ask if you could talk about why the ocean? And yeah. um, because there's a few different things that are prevalent throughout all your work, no matter what form it's being shown in, it's this color. Mm -hmm. And it's um, the threes, like a kind of a sim uh, ongoing pattern of threes. And then also the ocean. And I know that you've worked with um, marine biology before. And um, I'm, I'm interested how you came to the ocean and why it's such an important part of your work. Yes, thank you. Yeah, please stop me. And I'm, I'm all for questions. So um, the ocean, I, I, feel, I felt like me personally doing this like ancestral healing work, I felt, um, I've always felt since I was a, a child, even in the womb, we're, we're in like uh, water, um, but I felt more connected and more myself in the ocean and any aspect of water than I have on land. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been this huge fascination of studying marine biology um, and trying to find ways to fuse that with art. Now I'm more science and, and art history, math and English were never my strong suit, but um, there's a lot of wonder, a lot of whimsy, this large, um, 
I feel like the, the ocean is our largest body. Um, if we're thinking of this, like, uh, this idea of what it represents, the largest body we have on planet Earth is the ocean. And that is our womb, our, our sacred place of, of comfort and protection. So if we constantly ignore that and, and with environmental um, issues that are happening over the years, I think that that is, you know, uh, you know, we're not nurturing mother nature in the ways that we should. Um, and there's been this really uh, huge connection to the animals in the sea and, and you know, whether it's, it's the plant life that, that grows there and how each part contributes to who we are, you know, as humans. And um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, still unsolved things where I'm fascinated with like ancient Atlantis and feeling like that is where um, I, I've had a past life in and, um, mm -hmm connecting to like uh, me being an empath and uh, an indigo child or, you know, part of the star seeds. Um, and I can talk to anyone further who would like to hear more about that, even outside of this conversation. But um, the ocean has been my, my oxygen, my, uh, my, my second uh, part of my wholeness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with science, that has been a, a way for me to rewrite my own code, find my own language through color, shape, and form to almost reclaim that history of thinking of, um, you know, the Afro-Indigenous women and the, the children who I, I think, me personally, they, they rest, their spirit rests, you know, at the bottoms of these oceans that were neglected and were sacrificed and uh, I've, I feel like that is where um, part of my, my future will be is to uh, campaign and advocate for the, the, the wellness and holistic uh, contributions to the ocean. And I can talk further about those plans coming up. Um, but thank you for asking that. And if, I, if you need me to answer a little bit further, I can. Um, no. But that is science and, and art have been like one in one. And uh, even under the circumstances with the pandemic um, shift, I uh, moon water, I charge my own moon water, as Natalie, Natalie was saying earlier, and uh, similar to what you do with crystals, um, like a quartz, I charge water. That is my like version of sage for mm -hmm. um, cleansing the atmosphere and my, you know, using it for skincare and art rituals. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I completely transformed something that was once sculptural into this idea of me being a mermaid, me digitally trying to represent this like lunar log um, and uh, have these like connections of original photographs that um, I took um, and manipulating them in a really, um, this really unique way of, of a new language. Mm -hmm. um, so the next image I have uh, I'll show you. This is actually a fusion of both my grandmother's um, grave sites. And um, I thought that I also would introduce this because I constantly talk about my grandmother's as my, my way of connecting, my way of, um, of being and, and why I'm here. Um, while I'm working, anytime that I've worked in my, in my spaces of um, peace and solitude, um, I channel the, their energy and I feel them very much um, every day, um, but more strongly when I'm working um, artistically. And so I fuse together as like a collage um, their, their plots. One is at Arlington Cemetery and, uh, and the other is at Resurrection, which um, both of them have been honored in ways where this has been like a, a grounding place that my mom and I have have really healed each other. And um, that is something that in my families on both sides, the women, uh, you know, of course they are the nurturers, but they also um, had to hold all, they were the glue to everything and the strength, but they made a lot of sacrifices to the point where their emotions and their feelings and their, their opportunities and their goals and dreams were not at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. um, so my goal was to, um, and I think my mission in life is to uh, carry their, um, all of their, their those lost um, opportunities or lost thoughts that they did not get to verbally share or uh, physically share. Um, I, I would like to carry that um, to, um, into this space now. 
Um, so this is, this is my, um, my image that I keep with me and um, really guided by their presence where I sit out for hours. Um, um, and unfortunately right now it's like restrictions on, on access. I can still access the space, um, but it still is a very weird, eerie feeling when I go. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all, that this is, this is them together and like the realm of these, uh, this uh, start of where I start to think, to think of uh, honoring memorials, um, memorials, or I just like to say memorials, that's my way of saying it. Um, and in this project, uh, thinking of ways where I talked with Natalie on how to transition these shells that I, I was making on campus and they're stored away so they'll be safe and they will resurface into something really beautiful in an installation um, in the future. But for these, I, I started to also uh, deconstruct and really uh, find iconography within my own home setting, within my own body, and um, really tapping into these uh, multi-layered uh, repetitious pieces that uh, is almost like this aquatic voyage just in a, um, another uh, realm of, of um, decoding. So uh, this set of, of imagery, if you look in the center here, um, the one, two, three, four, these are the four that are presented um, for this um, piece that was the star another starting point. Um, and it's a shell basin that I was gifted um, from my paternal grandmother that I use every day. And it's in the shape of this clam. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just thought that it would be great to have that also act as like an aura or this like self portrait of, of the aura of the spirit of, of myself in this daily um, practice. So I just, I've designed it to something really interesting, but in the center that is, those are the, um, the actual pieces. It's interesting how when we started talking about that basin, we were just talking about your own personal like daily rituals um, in your home. And it's interesting how we had that conversation and then now your home is your medium. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's, it's something that I, I, you know, I talked to you also on the phone uh, earlier in the, the months, but about how uh, we, we have all the answers in front of us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And for me, uh, once I started to uh, respond to the answers and not, uh, you know, be fearful of them, I realized that all of my materials were, were always presently available and almost as gifts um, for me that um, I needed to put into uh, the work. And um, I also like to add to how important self-care is for me too with being um, a woman of color who suffers from reproductive health issues like endometriosis. That was also this eye-opening uh, way for me to uh, have artist therapy and uh, why sk skin care and um, vitamins. I have so many like, you'll be surprised I have like kelp and algae that I take, ginger, I love ginger, but sea moss is great. Mm -hmm. um, but these are ways that I was trying to, in, in the search of, in search of me trying to heal others, I realized I was healing myself. And then that's unbreaking cycles of the past histories of women who um, in my family who also suffered with similar um, health issues that um, I am rewriting that history to shift and change. So this is the basin that I go to every morning and this is how I cleanse and restart and, and almost, um, you know, in the art space, it's the only time I'm not in pain mm -hmm. um, and coming out of it un unconsciously or consciously, this is um, like my medicine um, so I just like to share that just to be more honest and open. This next set, um, is like, uh, the, the physical aspect of me seeing myself as the mermaid or the triple moon goddess and, um, having, uh, there's these three on the side that are the actual, uh, originals of what that is. And I've just designed it in a way that's, um, also heightening movement or emphasizing movement, but uh, looking at myself as the, the, you know, in three different ways, the maiden, the uh, mother and the crone. And uh, I've tapped into those three spaces of, um, you know, emphasizing that more. And you'll see subtle changes of 
that which also starts to look um, more like the vaginal space, the room space where the feet are and how they're positioned and me um, taking multiple shots of this and seeing the, the feet for me um, being a, uh, in my zodiac realm, my natal chart, um, it describes the, the Pisces to have um, their area of focus on the body as the foot or the feet and um, how important that that is. And that is for me the most challenging thing if we're talking about chakras, the, the root chakra um, and I started to really uh, sit back and reflect on how, uh, you know, I've had, um, I have to really pay attention to that grounding place and uh, thinking of the mermaid as having that duality of, of um, transformation. I wanted to represent those in three different ways of um, my grandmothers um, and myself. So I'll just go through and let me know how, if we're good on time. Um, apologies for the glitches earlier and that rainbow buffer. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, on the right side, these are the originals that are available. And then um, emphasis on movement in this presentation of um, just variations of, of travel, of transport, and all of my, my work existing, where I see this location of this work existing is in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, in between uh, the spaces of like that uh, Bermuda Triangle and, and seeing that as like some type of uh, mysterious um, gem portal that can really hold to a lot of information. So I have plans of sailing the, the Atlantic, you know, in the future and, and getting my, uh, my license to, boating license to really travel and explore what the Atlantic Ocean holds for me. And I've had nothing but, but great um, experiences in, um, with water and the men in my family are fishermen, the women are swimmers. So that just adds to even more um, connections to, um, to that. And also thinking of shells is something really important. I was building these uh, oyster shells that looked more alien cosmic like. And I, um, my, my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother and my mother's middle name is Pearl. So that was just like even more affirmation of um, continuing this, this talk, continuing this journey of uh, these water marine aspects that um, can lead to more answers. And also the healing too, because of all of the, the grief and the pain in the ocean. Um, yes. And also, I remember at one point in your studio, we were talking about how this color that you use throughout your work is similar to um, the algae, correct me if my science terms are wrong, but the algae that coral reefs use to heal themselves too, which has always just stuck in with me as this like, both the magic of our bodies and also of the ocean and the potential for healing um, through these intergenerational um, healing rituals. Yes, um, 100%. Um, these colors, um, believe it or not, um, and this is for, for this particular show, these are the darker shades of this, um, of this series. And then I have a lighter shade that's part of the Mount Royal um, series. Um, and thinking of day and night, uh, uh, that whole type of duality too, I wanted to emphasize that. Um, but these colors very much exist in the seas. Um, and uh, offer offer uh this this new realm of healing like you were saying um i i yeah that's very true yes um so this like both science fiction like and like very like hopeful and also but very real because you're doing it at, you are the vessel for this healing in your own body i yes thank you i i definitely see myself as a vessel and um almost uh sometimes it's hard for me to figure out if my dreams are the rea the reality or my realities are the dreams um, because uh, I, I don't, I still have not felt, felt like I am, uh, you know, I'm where I am um, in the physical <laughs> space. So uh, there's, there's a lot of levels to uh, figuring that out and doing more research on, on what that is for empaths and, uh, you know, uh, have feeling like you've had past lives. I, uh, wanted to, I'm still discovering that and um, opening new information. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this um, set, and again, on the right side, these are the three original. Um, this was a collaboration I did with a uh, 
uh, of, of really capturing myself in um, like doing another set of aura photos and um, having having them really be like a uh, sorry my phone was going off I have a time or two um, <laughs> So uh, also capturing the aura space and really uh, the, the student was Leah Laddie. She's a, a sophomore photo major at MICA and we s collaborate on color and, and space and, and shape and, and um, composition of, of capturing um, myself in three different spaces, three different angles and how important it was to have my hair involved in the piece more visibly uh, again layering my the different foot images on top of that to emphasize transport divine femininity or dark divine femininity and uh, I, I see myself also collaborating with her more um, in terms of the uh, traditional portraiture and what that represents um, and bending so. everything through your own visual and um, well language and on all different kinds of media Yes, so I'll just go through these just to save time, but again, more sets of taking those original three photos of my, my feet and layering them over other original photos that I captured throughout the years, uh, my two years um, in Mount Royal, um, whether they're indoors or outdoors. Um, this is particularly specifically at like Assateague Island um, and playing a part of uh, this like shoreline, this horizon line, this like... Uh, uh, really this fantasy realm of, of space and time. And I also got approved to uh, exhibit my, um, before everything was completely shut down <laughs> um, and with the government and the world, but um, got approval to showcase my shells um, at Assateague Island to document. So that's, don't worry, that is coming very soon once everything can can clear out and be safe and healthy for everyone. But um, that was a beautiful place that I, um, I felt like I, I was very connected to. Uh, this is another you know, series. Oh, yes. I was going to say in the interest of time, because I know you and I could talk forever. I'm wondering if, could you just give people like a, a little exam, a brief explanation of what they can find on your page on the, in the exhibition and how sound is also incorporated? Yes, 100%. So I, I'll just go through these um, for everyone who mm -hmm. might not have time. Um, but also on the notyetfuturefree.org site, I do have um, a sound piece, uh, two sound pieces, which I highly recommend um, everyone to listen to on your own time as a takeaway, because that is another form of sketching for me. And um, I, I produce and I have a music background, which I, I'm rediscovering my love for again of communicating and uh, taking past like uh, pop culture references that were inspiration to me and then moving more instrumentals with um, nature sounds that I've collected or my actual um, ritual baths that I've been having over this, um, this time of, of Paul's um, due to the uh, COVID-19, I've, I've documented and, and showcased that in a very uh, specific way. Um, so feel free to listen to that on my artist page. And um, they also, I have like a series of eight and that is also to reflect the eight phases of the moon. Um, so it's all very, there's so many codes to the point where I, I feel like in five, 10, 15, and you know, further um, 15 years ahead that uh, my work will slowly be um, uncoded. And I purposely do not put all of that information at the forefront, but you really have to sit and, um, and be with the work for a while to then slowly get more answers. Um, so I, um, yes, thank you so much everyone. And I um, am 100%, 100% uh, just appreciative for this space and this time. Um, this is the, the site and this is the, uh, the SoundCloud link where you can uh, listen to more of that um, sound piece. And then we have um, 2020.mica grad show um, that you can uh, view my artist page where I go in more detail of the work and, and um, what's ahead. So thank you so much. And um, yes, for everyone's time. I'm you so appreciative. Thank you. No, thank you. It's such a joy to share this with you. And I'm just so, so thankful. And if anyone has questions for Nina, 
like um, and continues to ponder it, put them in, keep putting them in the comments. It's amazing to see all of your feedback and thoughts and we'll try to address them if there's time at the end. So thank you all. All right, well, not to transition so abruptly, but um, Rex, I'm excited to hear about your work too and what you've been working on. Um, take a second. Um, Rex and I have also been talking for about a year. And so this, the work that she's been thinking about has um, been evolving and it's been incredible to, to see how you've been researching and bringing research into your practice. Um, so yeah, would you like to screen share or just talk whichever one? Um, I'll talk and then screen share and keep while I keep talking, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, I have a, just like a few things to share alongside that I'll probably just have going while I talk as well. But um, I just want to say thank you so much, Nia. It was amazing to hear you talk. We have not met in person. Um, so it's so cool to hear how you're working and thinking about and responding to this project because it really resonates with me too, like the act of layering and um, translating and moving through all the different iterations of your work. It's really cool to hear. I can't wait to meet you in person. Um, yeah, and thank you, Natalie. One day. <laughs> yeah, I know, one day. Um, yeah, Natalie and I were talking about this project for almost a full year, I think, and um, it came at a really perfect time. There's like, I feel really invested in this project in a way that I haven't in others, I think, maybe ever, um, in that it feels like it has an origin story to it, uh, personally. And um, it kind of begins with investigating re what research can mean in my, in my practice in a very concrete way. So right as Natalie kind of and I started talking about this project, I discovered an archive um, of stories, which I will share with you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, cool. Um, so I discovered uh, the Iranian oral history archive um, about a year ago, and uh, it turned into a total Pandora's box for me, for my, for my practice and for this particular project. Um, the archive, I highly recommend everyone jumping into if you have any interest in the process of archiving and documenting personal uh, accounts through history. Um, it's ex not only extremely organized, but just like a total um, treasure. It's a total treasure. And basically it's an archive of audio and written accounts, um, specifically in regards to contemporary and modern Iranian history and politics between 1920 and 1980. And I stumbled into this archive as like a, as the beginning and continuing of a search to understand um, where my family comes from and what's happening in Iran right now and what that means in relationship to me and my life and my identity. Um, and this archive became a huge jumping off point um, for this project, um, which I, it has many components, and so describing it is very fun for me, but please stop if you have any questions. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it, for all intents and purposes, translating. Um, mm -hmm. It is, um, it's pretty and much- that's kind of where, sorry to interrupt, but that's kind of where we started too, was like at the thought of translating and how we translate and how we are unable to translate certain things, or just to like clue everyone in. That was like the kernel of our conversation. Yeah, yeah. She's like, you know, I'm thinking about a show about translation. And I'm like, oh my God, my whole practice is about translation. Um, and I work in a really multidisciplinary way. So to give you kind of context, I work in sculpture, uh, installation, performance art, and dance. And so simultaneously to discovering this archive, I was also diving into the dance practice that I've established now um, and how dance is re was re-entering my uh, fine art work at that time. So on the topic of translation, you know, the project really originated with the idea of translating this archive, um, parts that I can and cannot understand, into movement 
and into sculpture and and so on and so forth. And so it's kind of like a taking apart of this original source and kind of filtering it and making it into like a hybrid translation through many forms over and over again until it really embodies the um, beautiful failure that I experience in in this exploration of Iranianness and identity and history. Um, I, you know, I don't speak the language. I'm le actively learning the language. A lot of the choreographic scores that were produced from this project, which I can share a bit on the site, mm -hmm. um, things like this. Um, this is just one example. Um, the, the choreographic scores are embracing the not knowing and the knowing. It's both like an internal and an external uh, moment. So it's very much me taking on a story that I honestly have no business in taking on, but that I feel an intrinsic connection to. And I'm truly and in earnest, uh, desperate to understand, literally. Um, and so SIFT, the archive has both English and Farsi uh, accounts of very particular moments in time and very particular characters in, uh, in the history of the country at a very uh, turbulent many decades and on, onward. Um, and so these scores were kind of produced from, okay, how do I, you know, emulate the gesture of the character? How do I emulate the tone of voice? How do I, you know, take that gesture and then turn it into something that is kind of quite removed from the original uh, point of interest? Um, and then how do I engage with a long, long history of scores uh, in order to do so? You know, things like instructions um, for more clarity. Um, and probably having to sit through much shorter bits of, like short bits of story in order to like translate them or think about what that, how that shows up in the body too. Absolutely, yeah. And like, you know, throughout the process of this project, which um, I would love to, I wanna get into next, I think the process has become even more the content, you know, and like really embracing the fact that these, that the interpretations and like the direction that I'm taking with other people's stories um, are becoming then, entangled with my family's history and my family's stories from that particular time in the country and then now into my experience of Iran from so far away um, and my experience of my identity mixed in with my very American experience um, and my experience of language and and all the visual languages that I'm attempting to use. Um, mm -hmm. the age for me and like the kind of exciting part of having this project be online uh, is that it's very much a representation of a build kind of like what Nina was describing in like this it's like this layering um, and so for me this feels like an interesting exploration for making the process the content and kind of blurring the lines between process and content. Um, mm -hmm. I because I work in so many different ways, there's also a lot of other things going on beyond the initial point of engagement, being translating the text into movement. Um, I'm also creating textile and sculptural installation objects in Stable's gallery space, which I am so, so entirely grateful and lucky to have access to still. Um, with, wi with which I'm kind of creating these sets and these further points of removal. Um, it's been really interesting working with video and the camera lens in a way that I didn't anticipate as intensely uh, until this you know, change in format. Um, the textiles are all made from digital images from live performances. And so my aim with creating these as a set is further confusing space and time and further translating live work into uh, other forms. Um, the, again, this like translating as a form of trying to understand and then trying to understand failing. It's kind of a cycle that goes through really all of my work and particularly uh, in this piece. 
Um, the title of this project, for, um, if I didn't say at the beginning, is Everything I Hold is Wet. Um, that phrase I hold very near and dear and honestly is kind of my entire artist statement for my practice at this moment in time. Uh, everything is so slippery, you know, everything, uh, understanding and getting a hold of something concrete feels uh, less and less possible. And the impossibility of that I find really generative and um, more interesting than the final destination. Um, so further iterations of this work are gonna be living on the website. There's going to be uh, more videos of me moving around in the space and doing a lot of body research, spatial research, um, trying to interact, you know, already this particular set has transformed into something else and, and I cannot wait to share uh, what those iterations are. Um, I want to go through every element, but I also want to be respectful of time. Um, but I will say, I mean, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, take all the, take the time you need. I'll give you like a warning when you need to cool. wrap it up. <laughs> <Keep going. Okay. laughs> Yeah, I'm really, as I was saying before, like the process is becoming so much of the content and the exciting, again, thing about this form of working in quarantine is that all of this is going to be, while it's living on the website, is leading to a kind of a final culminating event, um, which will be kind of the layering and the stacking of all this visual research that lives on the website and also my personal movement research that I'm doing and chipping away at every day. Um, to kind of create, a, a, it's, I like to use the, the word phrase. Um, it's a, a word that's used a lot in dance. You know, you learn a phrase. Uh, it's a combination of movements strung together. And so for me, this entire project and like the idea of everything I hold is wet is uh, a stringing together of a phrase and I'm not entirely sure where the, where the, where the period is coming in. Um, and so the destination is uh, going to be on the perform at the performance on the 29th where I'll be live streaming most of the afternoon um, and ending in kind of this culminating performance. Um, the really exciting uh, part of the performance for me beyond the research, I mean all of this has been so generative, but it's really representing uh, the fruits of that research, you know, it's, it's kind of really embracing that every element can be kind of exploded apart and placed into every element of the installation and every movement. Um, there's so much purpose in everything and I think the combination in all those, all the, those intentions of purpose by stacking them, I think kind of flatten it, obscure, and then turn into something else. Um, and so things that I'll be using in that performance, for instance, will be uh, cinder blocks that you see in a lot of these uh, video installations as well. Um, the textiles, a lot of wood, a lot of the language of building, because I'm built, trying to build this phrase. Um, there'll be um, more flu like fluid objects, things like water, things like um, clay, things that are, you know, more tangible. Um, the presence of the recordings will also be there. That's very important, um, including the voice where all of this came from. Um, and so a lot of the English and Farsi will be combined and layered as well to create this uh, extra dimension of research and kind of see how many, um, how many clues kind of end up rising to the surface in viewing what the movement ends up as. Um, what words stand out, what names, what moments in time, uh, things like that. So I did... Uh, I was going to say, Rex, quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the last part of your description right there, when you say archiving gesture, mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting that we've had, we've transitioned to an online media in the sense of thinking about your work as literally archiving gesture outside of just this one culminating performance. But because this work feels like it will never, it's never completely finished because that's the slipperiness of it and that you don't have to end at that period. You can keep following 
the translation and the gestures and where they take you. And so it's, I just want to say it's so beautiful to see your work encapsulated in this way um, because it is this like beautiful ambiguity and like unfinishedness of it, which I think is often something we don't see a lot in performance. Performance by nature is like very, like there's a huge finale, there's a beginning when you sit down, there's an end. Um, no matter how you try to subvert that there, this, even though filming and performing for a camera is probably incredibly like uh, disarming in some ways too. And I want to get into that maybe a little bit later, but I'm just, I just wanted to bring that out too. And like how you are archiving through your body, but also um, continuing to build upon it too. Yeah. And I, I mean, I really appreciate that. And it is true that there's not always a lot of space to, uh, to do that and to like participate in your practice publicly. Um, so I think there's a lot, like a little bit of anxiety around it and also a lot of excitement around, uh, you know, sharing so much of what's happening um, before this, like you said, this culminating performance. And also having the option of the culminating performance feels really important to me as someone who is engaging in performance art and dance and things that do have uh, the expectation of a finality. Um, even though anyone who's here now knows this project will go on forever, um, there is this uh, satisfaction in, you know, here is an established chunk of time, you know, 30 minutes. Um, I'll be live for five hours, which is very important, but that the, that like the building, building the final performance and having all those obscuring languages and lenses happening at once um, can remain important at the same time as the archive uh, continues to build in a less uh, contained way. Um, I think I, I think I'll stop there. I might show a little bit. It's just like a minute or two of these videos that aren't on the site yet that I just made yesterday in the spirit of hearing things that are not complete quite yet. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Rex. That's incredible to see. Also, just to see it all coming together is like just mind blowing. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. I feel like that's the first time I think I've seen it with the audio overlaid too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm having a really good time with that. Can't wait to talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah, so just one reminder to just keep checking the website and to see this work unfold because we are regularly uh, updating pages as work emerges. Um, but thank you so much, Rex, and thank you again for just sharing your process with us. Um, all right, so last I want to talk a little bit with you, Shay, about what we've been working on and talking about um, also for a year. Shay um, was also working on a performance um, to be shared on May 31st and she still has, you still have a performance that day. Um, but I just wanted to talk with you and continue this conversation about 
movement and language and translation. Um, and um, particularly with, we were talking about um, disrupting systems and you were working on a language of your own creation. So would you mind talking a little bit about um, your plans for the project? Sure. Um, so originally I was choreographing an improv score uh, for two artists who would be doing the movement and I was going to be directing the sound. Um, so I had devised a system using different sounds as cues or triggers for different movements. Um, and I was gonna have each dancer have their own list of um, like actions that co like coordinated with different sounds. And the two dancers wouldn't know each other's um, like list of like which sounds coordinated which, with which movement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their directions would be in harmony, sometimes their directions would be in opposition, and sometimes they would be neutral. Um, so meaning, for example, if I were to um, ding a bell, maybe mm -hmm. person A's direction was to travel a distance, and then person B's direction was to get in their path and stop the other dancer from traveling the distance. Um, but they wouldn't know in advance until the moment within the performance. And I had also asked the dancers to devise a physical language between each other that I wasn't going to know. So I meant like if one of them put up a finger, the other knew what to do. Um, and I would never have known the directions that they had created within their own language system. Mm -hmm. And so our thinking obviously for your project had to significantly shift. Um, and you and I were just talking about this earlier about how um, the interruptions and disruptions that you wanted to give to dancers in some ways were thrown at us by having to respond to a pandemic and disrupt our plans and ways of presenting. Um, so I wonder like how, how you've been thinking about choreographing yourself and um, the language, your own language that you are using um, in a more like solo way rather than with others? Um, so I'm still working this out actually um, because the idea before was to have at least some amount of novelty of the dancers not knowing in advance what to expect and as I direct myself um, so this performance is now going to be a solo where I will be the only person performing um, mm -hmm. and now my challenge is trying to understand how I can devise a language still and use that language as a way to trigger my movements throughout a like maybe 30 or 40 minute improvised performance um, mm -hmm. um, and somehow managing to inject the element of surprise <laughs> or like I'm now questioning how can I trigger myself, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we were talking about how you could create your language, like as a score for yourself to then respond to, but still with some randomness. Um, can you talk about why you were, th why you were thinking about um, this in the first place, like disrupting systems and how, um, why that was important? for you to consider with language? Um, so I had been thinking about um, the fact that as humans, we mostly move through life as a series of habits. Um, we, I feel like we believe that we make decisions about how we will behave, but in actuality, as we grow older, we have evolved to develop a, like a series of habits and based on impulses, uh, we are triggered to use, to, we are triggered to continuously, sorry, <laughs> to continuously use these habits. Um, so as I move through the day, based on my sensory awareness, um, based on different obstacles that I encounter, 
I believe that I make decisions about how I behave, but in reality, I think that I continuously perform the same habits. And um, I feel like to break out of habits, we have to use our imagination and be willing to Mm -hmm. use intuition and be willing to subject ourselves to not knowing and accepting not knowing. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is such a core part of this project. Um, I think it's so beautiful, your uh, intention. I just want to hold this up to have um, your dancers originally create their own language that you didn't know. I think that's, it was just such a brave idea that even though it can't happen at this moment, I just think it's like such a fascinating thing to continue to think about as humans. And because one of the things that we had talked about too is how we're always devising new ways of communicating with each other or um, breaking rules in the moment to respond to triggers or to um, heal ourselves and better relate and communicate with each other. Um, And so I'm, I'm just, I'm interested perhaps like how your improvisational background and because your practice is um, very much based in improvisation um, and how that kind of connects to this idea of disruption and system breaking. Mm -hmm. Um, I think improvisation as performance process is a metaphor for life. Um, As I move through the day, I may have a plan, I may have a framework or a structure, Mm -hmm. but obviously life doesn't care about my framework and my structures. Um, So I'm continuously using what is in my arsenal, what is in my tool bags, what knowledge I have to um, make decisions or as I feel I make decisions, but again, I really believe that I'm, using language that I have or habits that I have to navigate Mm -hmm. the constant, like the constant shape of the world. Yeah. I think that's kind of what I was getting at too, is that the fact that it's a metaphor for life and also how we're all um, like, again, the shift of this whole project to process rather than finished product and how um, by improvising you are, it, that is like the process as the performance in some ways. Um, and I remember I've talked to you about like process too and how that the, the knowledge of process and following that rather than also ever thinking that you are at an end or that anything is finished. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually want to point out one thing that I forgot mention I originally when I was choreographing for the dancers um, I had two people in mind and one person is a trained dancer and has been working professionally as um, a dancer for over a decade probably 20 years at this point and the other person has no dance training um, and I was really interested in the what possibilities there could be from having two people interact in a movement-based performance with one person being so trained and also a professional improvisational performance artist and the other person basically only having pedestrian movement as their Mm -hmm. vocabulary. Um, Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that because I realized I forgot. Yeah, and I'll start slowly transitioning and opening the conversation up a little bit to all three of you too, because I think there's like an interesting conversation between your work, Rex, and yours, Shay's, in that um, this a conversation between movement and dance and like what is dance, because dance often thinks it has a very like set language, whereas movement is something that we all know we participate in always, we're maybe not always aware of it, um, but like Shay, just at the beginning of this talk, you centering, guiding all of us into our bodies, all of a sudden my heart, which was racing, just getting into this virtual world, all of a sudden just stopped. Like, and my whole system like rewrote itself just by like paying attention. And I think there's something very accessible about thinking about the language of movement um, as something that is not 
it's outside of the dance world, but then there is also just so much to play with in the dance world and all of these languages. And I know both of you guys have backgrounds in um, more like rigid dance. Um, and I wonder how you, maybe you can both answer this, how you've disrupted those languages and reinterpreted them into, and to making them, to making it your own language of movement. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely had a very rigid upbringing in dance. Um, I used to be in like choreography based dance team where it was like 25 people all doing the exact same movement um, and we would prepare all year for six minute competitions. So um, after a while, after like five years of being in, on teams like that, I started to feel really confined because obviously everything was based in choreography and being as rigid as possible. Um, and I, as I moved away from that, I sort of felt like, what is dance? What is movement? Um, what, do, what makes something um, stage worthy versus not stage worthy? If, am I dancing if I'm standing still? Um, and I feel like all moments involve movement, like all of life is movement. Even as I am sitting here, I'm currently moving. Everything in my body is uh, a series of systems that are in motion that are keeping me alive. Um, and so that is a miracle. <laughs> and so I think all movement can be celebrated as, a, as performance worthy. Oh, I love hearing you talk about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel the same way in so many, in so many ways. I think I love that you use the word celebrate, like celebrate worthy, celebration worthy, and also like a miracle because that's probably what keeps me coming back. I think like movement is a totally insane, like being aware of movement is a crazy location to be living in you know to like really like draw attention to everything as a performance or as meaningful uh is pretty wild um yeah I also came from a really strict and like professionalized dance training um predominantly in ballet and in contemporary dance um and so I think the transition out of that and into what I'm doing now, while it's been over the course of many years, it's kind of reclaiming. I mean, I think, yeah, like reclaiming that training uh, and disrupting it um, in, the, this disruption of that training is really empowering, I think, personally. And I think there's so much to be found um, in showing someone a, a trained thing that's being disrupted. I think it's uh, just like um, showing somebody that it's okay and showing something that all movement is meaningful um, in a very specific way. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And I think I'm, I'm still figuring out what dance and movement mean separate from each other and together. Um, yeah. I have a mini aha moment that I just made like as from an inner child, but in terms of dancing and for me, uh, being a ballerina, being in, like inspired to be one as a child and uh, looking at Alvin Ailey, um, Martha Graham, Debbie Allen, those were like my sources of like, uh, just in awe of, of that power of movement and, and looking at my work now, how I focused on the, the foot and um, uh used to play with the different positions of my feet as a child to replicate what the dancers were doing. Um, I just made that mini connection and um, it's really powerful that the three of us have um, some sort of whether in different levels of experience but how important the body um, and the the centering of the body is uh, just as important um, but that was just a mini connection so yes. I love yeah. That. I love that too because actually one of the reasons that this conversation started was because I also have a background in dance and had been um, reconsidering how that 
background in very classical ballet had the imprint it had left on my body or the trace of it in my body as both a oppressive force um, and also a powerful potential to know have certain languages and the ability to learn different kinds of movement qu more quickly um, because of that training, but then also how it restricted me and trying to disrupt both and see the power, but also see the power of the disruption. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's amazing having this conversation with you all. And again, it like gives me this yearning to be in person with all of you. And um, to, so I, I hope this is just a teaser for conversations to come. Um, yeah, my, I thank you all again for putting all of these incredible comments in the text. I'm reading through them and I'm just I'm overwhelmed. It's like an archive here as well. Um, I was wondering what you all, this conversation might take us to the end. So again, if anyone has any other questions that they would like to ask, please put them in the comments um, now. But I wonder, so much of your work is about, all of all three of you, is about rethinking systems and recoding the body. Um, and I wonder, as an audience member observing dance, I feel such um, power and almost mimicry in my body when I'm watching dance. I feel it physically too. And that was what inspired me as a child to become a dancer. And I wonder in this moment when we're all so separated and your performances and your work are so isolated from other people and especially from your audience members, what in this moment, what do you hope people will take away through observing and watching your performances or rituals or work? Take all the time you need. <laughs> I'll go. Um, that that really is was right at the surface for my thought process. But um, I've this uh, this year has been really focused on like the emotional state of the work and um, coming from an art school, you know, that heavy institutional background, we can tend to in 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 that space uh, forget about how we feel. And um, I personally would want. Um, everyone who views my work to have some type of feeling, some type of emotional connection that um, the, the physical work or in this virtual space, the work, what type of aura is transmitting um, onto the viewer um, and how emotionally uh, they are connected to that space. So it necessarily does not have to be uh, through, through words, but just a feeling. I think that that's um, almost indescribable what that is. Thank you. Rex or Shay, want to take a stab? I can take, I'll take a stab. Um, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, trans, uh, I can't stop using the word translate, so forgive me, but translating the work about translation onto a computer and have so much space and time and distance between the people who are watching it is something I've been really preoccupied by and so I think like it's an interesting question because I think the goals I maybe had for the performance in person are a little bit changed now because they're remote and I think they've changed to like a several fold hope and that is that for those who can like pop onto the website and like see the very in process based movements that there is like a feeling of perhaps catharsis or, um, you know, that feeling that you described of like watching someone move. And even if you're not moving or you're, you know, don't have the ability to move in this moment, that there's like something happening. Like I do believe that like moving whether you're in right in front of someone or from afar, I hope that does something to you, to the people who are observing. And I also hope that people jump into this archive and um, figure, like have their own experience of something that I have my own very personal experience to, um, and that they kind of rethink what their own archival practices might be, might be and might, what might they might look like. Um, 
Mm. And that's all I really have language for, I think, right now. No, that's great. I think that's so interesting to think about us all as an archive, a moving archive that is changed, that we have control over, but we also don't have control over in some way, too. Shay? <laughs> um, so I think, again, I would like to return to repeating that movement and especially improvisational movement as a metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. um, um, like Natalie mentioned, we are all having to continuously adjust, especially this project um, because of the current pandemic. Um, and by using improvisational movement, I would like to share a demonstration of the ability to make choices, to break habits, to turn your focus towards navigating the obstacles or even the mundanity of staying inside for days on end. Um, I really like the ability to use an improvisational score and to use either what's traditional dance movement or very pedestrian movement and to demonstrate movement that's, I think, very accessible to many people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's quite hard to say what I hope people will take away, but. I mean, I, Shay, I feel like you already, <laughs> you gave us what that, you led this sure. <laughs> and as, um, I feel like it's, I'm like putting words in your mouth maybe, but like you demonstrating what it meant to lead us through our bodies I think is is so powerful and especially this idea of movement as stillness sometimes and sometimes the most powerful movement is the most subtle and slow is something I just keep coming back to over and over again through this project and through my conversations with all of you because there's this repeated theme of um, slowness and subtlety in order to imagine the most drastic and impossible, seemingly impossible change when we feel that everything is outside of our control and our everything can feel so um, completely, uh, we can be just overwhelmed in our feelings of grief and um, uh, sadness sometimes. And I think that through trying to simplify things in, in the moment and um, be in solidarity with each other through this stillness is just, there's so much there. <laughs> like, and I think that's, I mean, that's what I hope people, a few of us will get through this project is just mm -hmm. a reshifting and a refocus to the process and the, the slow that we all and contribute to um, and the collaboration of all of us. So it's sort of like, I almost want to like break out of the art world or break out of these like um, languages that seemingly constrict us in order to um, think of us, all of us as the artists and the, mo and the dancers. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. <laughs> These Thank conversations you. will continue. Um, we have <clears throat> two programs next week also. We have a natural dye workshop on Friday with the incredible Anne Lee, who will be working through um, her garden that she's been using to plant and grow um, plants for natural dyeing. And she will also have a very generous workshop where she'll show us how to use natural dye and natural dye fabrics at home. And that's a process of transformation and translation in it too because we're literally we're transforming fibers um and then next saturday there's another incredible artist walk with Mojda who's here and hannah who's i think is also here maybe and sarah bueno who'll be joining us from istanbul so the time next week for the artist talk is a little bit earlier to um coincide with her time um so it'll be from 2 to 3 30 so please join us again um and thank you all just so much for spending the afternoon with us today.
Oh, thank you. you. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Kaylee, did you have any last words or? I do, yeah. Um, this was so nice and I'm really enjoying all of the conversation in the sideline. This is something mm -hmm. we don't really get to experience when we're in the gallery space. So I hope to think about how we can capture that. Um, yes. But just a huge shout out to all the people who joined and those who donated. Stable is a nonprofit and we're working really hard to be able to continue to bring amazing programming like this. Um, so we just really, really appreciate it. Um, we've got some cool things in the works for our artists. And I know Natalie was plugging some great stuff. So I'm going to put two links in the chat, um, a link to donate if you feel moved by what you saw today and a link to sign up for our mailing because we do stuff all the time. Um, so just uh, check those out and uh, don't be a stranger. See you guys next week. Thank you all so much. It's so lovely to have like positive and healing virtual moments. So <laughs> thanks for moving through it with us and through all the glitches. See you all. Bye. Thank you, Rexina and Shay, so much. Yes, yeah, thank you, Natalie. <clears throat> Shout out to